I'm going to talk about evidence of cardiac synchronization therapy, left funnel branch block as a cause of cardiomyopathy. I'm going to talk about ways to identify left funnel branch block with echo and ECG. Then I'm going to move on to left funnel branch area pacing and then go over cases. So cardiac resynchronization therapy, or CRT, also known as biventricular pacing, is a procedure that electrophysiologists uh, offer for the treatment uh, of heart failure. And essentially, it's a procedure where we plan a lead typically in the right atrium, right ventricle, and then uh, in the coronary sinus. And the idea is that by pacing the right ventricle and the lateral wall of the left ventricle, we can get the two walls of the left ventricle, the septum and the lateral wall, to contract synchronously. And by doing this, we can either help the heart recover ejection fraction if it's dyssynchronous or prevent the development of cardiomyopathy. Class one guidelines for CRT are for patients with an EF of 35% or less, sinus rhythm, and a wide left funnel branch block with symptoms of heart failure. These guidelines are based off six landmark trials. Okay. I'm going to go over them very briefly. But in general, these trials started with patients with advanced heart failure with a wide QRS. Finding benefit here, then found benefit in those with minimal heart failure and a wide QRS. And then over time, found that the benefit was primarily limited to those with left funnel branch block, so a specific form of wide QRS. And this led to studies that left funnel branch block itself may be a cause of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. We might have to continue here. In 2003, the companion trial was, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, but it looked at people with EF of 35% or less, class 3 or ambulatory class 4 heart failure, yeah. and randomized them either to medicines or a CRT device, be it a CRT pacemaker or a CRT defibrillator. And what it saw was that with CRT, there was a significant reduction in heart failure hospitalization or death. And this is a, a, a graph that you're going to see just about every trial. CARE-HF came out a year later. It also looked at people with class 3 or ambulatory class 4 heart failure, a wide QRS, and signs of synchrony on echo. And essentially what you see here is CRT was associated with a significant reduction in heart failure. And over time, this translated into a reduction in mortality. And again, this is what we see in all the trials. Reverse now included people with class two to three heart failure, EF of 40% and a wide QRS and signs of mechanical synchrony on echo. All of these patients got a biventricular device, but it was randomized to either CRT off or CRT on. And in this population, you can see there's a significant reduction in heart failure. Made it CRT was probably the most influential uh, trial. This now looked at patients with an EF of 30%, class one or class two, so minim minimally symptomatic patients. And it was looking to see if this would prevent heart failure. In this trial, again, there is a significant reduction in heart failure. In this case, those who were randomized to CRT ICD versus an ICD alone. And this was the first study to identify that it's truly those with left funnel branch block who benefited. In the ICD arm, those with left funnel had the highest risk of heart failure or death, or in the CRT defibrillator arm, those with left bundle had the most benefit. When you stratify just by presence or absence of left funnel branch block, you see CRT has a very powerful effect, or if you look at the patients with non left funnels and CRT is a uh, non-significant sign that it may, may be harmful. RAFT was a very similar trial to, to made at CRT, EF of 35% in, in mild heart failure class two. And again, we see uh, CRT is associated with a reduction in heart failure. And over time, that translates into reduction in death. RAFT also stratified patients by the presence or absence of left funnel branch block. And again, you see CRT truly only benefits those with left funnel branch block and those without, but a wide QRS. There's almost a sign of harm, again, non-significant. So why is it that left funnel branch block is uh, the population of patients who benefit? Well, if you look at the schematic, you can see the left bundle innervates the left ventricle here. And that when it activates, um, it's like a secret highway where electricity all comes at once and all the walls contract together or in a way synchronously. 
if you have left funnel branch block, electricity only travels down the right bundle, and it has to take the quote unquote local roads. And what you'll get is a, uh, a rocking motion. So when you implant CRT, what you're essentially doing is putting in a prosthetic left bundle. You've got a lead here and then a lead over on this side. And by pacing together, you're restoring the ball motion. Since left bundle is so harmful, one question that uh, comes up is, is it its own cause of cardiomyopathy? Can dyssynchrony or that abnormal wall motion caused by left bundle branch block cause heart failure? Well, one way to look at that was, you know, CRT is limited for class one guidelines for EF of 35% or less, but actually there's randomized data for people with EF greater than 30%. To get intimated CRT at the referring sites, you had to have an echo of 30 or less. But when the, all those echoes were pulled at Brigham and Women's, and they looked at it in the core lab, what they found was pretty remarkable. But 40% at EFs greater than 30%, actually ranging from 30.1 to 45.3%, which is uh, perhaps a sign that there's a lot of variability in echo reads, but also that electrophysiologists probably aren't the best to adjudicate. Uh, nevertheless, when they stratified by, uh, by EF, the benefit for CRT uh, was in all EF groups. This suggests that left bundle can be fixed at almost any EF and have benefit. There's a large randomized trial called Block HF that looked at EF of 50% or less and class one, two, or three heart failure. These patients were randomized to either right ventricular pacing or biventricular pacing, also known as CRT. Again, why would RV pacing, uh, why would this might have benefit? Because RV pacing is a surrogate for left bundle. If you're pacing down here, it's almost like you've got electricity just coming down the right bundle. You pace here, and again, electricity will take the local roads and you'll get that rocking motion, or you'll get to also known as dyssynchrony. And what was found uh, in block HF was again, biventricular pacing was superior. In this situ situation, there was less heart failure. And then the echoes uh, over time were better. Those who have right ventricular pacing, they had dyssynchrony and over time their EF would drop and their chamber volumes would get enlarged. Uh, similarly, left funnel branch block was shown to be harmful in patients with an EF between 35 and 50%. Uh, this comes from the Mayo Clinic where they randomized those with a baseline echo and an ECG. They randomized left bundles with a narrow QRS control, so similar comorbidities. And what they found was um, those with left funnel branch block were far more likely to be admitted for heart failure, die of an EF that progresses to 35% or less, or have a VT event. In France, Valiant uh, published a nice paper that showed a population of people who had CR who were candidates for a CRT. In this case, all of them had left bundle for over five years, had no identical cause of cardiomyopathy. When they had their left bundle initially, had an EF that was normal. It eventually progressed to heart failure in EF of 35% or less. They had dyssynchrony on echo, and then everything normalized when they got CRT. This strongly suggests that left bundle on its own is a cause of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Uh, we did a study at Duke where we looked at all patients who had what we called isolated left bundle branch block or left bundle with uh, no other cardiac comorbidity, comorbidities and an EF that was normal. And we matched them to uh, a patient population of a narrow QRS who had identical uh, comorbidities and everyone had to have a, a fall echo at least six months later. And what we found was those with left bundles compared to the NARAS were 3.78 times more likely. When we took out the patients who had uh, inter, uh, who had MIs between echoes, the relationship got stronger. And then when we used a very strict definition of left bundle branch block, the relationship got even stronger. So in summary, CRT was initially found to benefit severely symptomatic patients with cardiomyopathy in a wide QRS, later found to benefit patients with mildly symptomatic heart failure, in a wide QRS. It was found to benefit patients with an EF greater than 30%. And then lar there are large observational cohorts that show harm for left funnel branch block in mid-EF. There's evidence that, it's, that left funnel branch block itself is an independent cause of cardiomyopathy. So if left funnel branch block is a mechanical cause of cardiomyopathy, i.e. causes dyssynchrony, do medications work in this population? 
if you think of severe microregitation, we don't give those patients medications when the EF declines because we know it's a mechanical problem. Uh, in general, medicines do is they suppress the pathologic neurohormonal axis with the renin angiotensin aldosterone uh, system. In essence, when the heart is pumping poorly, the kidneys sense it, and the kidney uh, releases renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone to whip the heart. This gets it to beat more powerfully, but over time, it can wear it out. So typically, the medicines we use uh, to prevent heart failure or to treat heart failure block this access. Spironolactone blocks aldosterone, ACE inhibitors and ARBs block angiotensin II release, and then uh, beta blockers uh, block renin. We look at all the landmark trials for these medications. Uh, there's all EF improvement over time, yet not one, one of these stratified outcomes by QRS morphology. So we don't know if these medicines even work with people who have blood funnel branch block. So this was a study that we did at Duke where we looked at all people who had a, a baseline echo and ECG. We took out everyone who had a, a heart transplant, now that or, or cardiac device, pacemaker, defibrillator, took all the patients out with severe valvular disease, and they all had to have a follow-up echo three months later. And then we stratified those patients by whether or not they had left bundle branch block, a wide QRS, uh, but non-left bundle or narrow QRS. And, and we saw that over time, those with left bundle branch block had the least amount of EF improvement. Those with a narrow QRS had the greatest EF improvement, and those with a wide QRS had, had kind of an intermediate. This is likely because these are people who have a lot of scar in their heart uh, through prior MIs or, or things like sarcoid, where the tissue is not going to improve. And we married uh, the echo results to uh, heart failure hospitalization. We saw again that the left bundles were the high, most likely to be hospitalized for heart failure. When we looked at mortality, again, we saw the left bundles were at the highest risk for dying. And when we put the two together, we again saw that the narrows did the uh, best. The wide QRS was kind of intermediate, and the lump bundles were the sickest and highest risk population. So in summary, lump bundle branch block is mechanical cause of heart failure, much like mitral valve disease. It causes dysynchrony. Dysynchrony is harmful. Medications have less benefit in this population. So now that we've identified left bundle branch block as a pathologic condition, how do we best identify it, both on ECG and on ECHO? I'm going to talk about this paper uh, also from Duke by Dave Strauss and Galen Wagner, uh, defining left bundle branch block in the area of cardiac resynchronization therapy. This paper was published in AHJ, which is kind of a minor journal, but it has over 200 citations because it's so elegant and it's been so influential. Uh, but essentially, in a narrow QRS, you can see that the heart is activated uh, synchronously, where the two papillary muscles go first, electricity kind of goes out uh, in all directions. Whereas in patients with left funnel branch block, the right ventricle, which is here, is activated first, and then electricity slowly moves out towards the septum into the lateral free wall. The first point that Dave's paper makes is that the classic definition of left funnel branch block, which is 120 milliseconds, is too short. For most males, uh, the heart is big enough that by the time it gets all the way out to the lateral wall, it'll be at least 140 milliseconds. And for females, it's 130. The reason why 120 is uh, too short is because when they were uh, initially making the definition for left bundles, they were studying dogs, and dog hearts are smaller than humans. The other key point was this concept of notching. When the right ventricle activates first in patients with life uh, bundle branch block, electricity travels to the septum, and then it stops, and then it keeps going through the apex and over to the lateral wall. When you have this abrupt stop in one area and continuation on others, what you get is a notch on the ECG. This notching then becomes critical for the definition of left funnel branch block. So there are a lot of mimickers of left funnel branch block that meet traditional criteria, which don't meet uh, the Strauss criteria, or Dave Strauss's criteria, also known as Turk criteria. Here's an example. This patient has left interior fascicular block and LBH. Over time, the QRS widens as the LBH widens. And then here, after five years from the presentation, you now have an ECG that meets uh, traditional criteria for left funnel branch uh, block. It's QRS over 120 milliseconds, but again, you see no notching. According to strict criteria, this wouldn't meet it as simply too narrow. Or if you wait even longer, um, it eventually gets out. 140 
142 milliseconds. Again, however, we don't have any notching. So what this is, is a left bundle mimic. In contrast, uh, what you get is a strict left bundle. Here's a patient who has a narrow QRS at baseline, and then in just one year, has rapid uh, uh, prolongation of the QRS, and now you have notching. Um, this is a true left bundle. Uh, this is the only explanation for the, the prolongation of QRS activation is uh, conduction system disease. How about echo? Can this show what left bundle branch block looks like? If, it's fixing if CRT fixes mechanical dyssynchrony and left bundle branch block is causing mechanical dyssynchrony? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, in the apical four, there are two striking characteristics you can see. Uh, during isovolumetric contraction, or the time where the heart's contracting, the aortic valve hasn't opened, there is a septal flash, which you can see here. And then uh, in the apex, there's an apical rock as the electricity goes this way. The presence of a septal flash and apical rock is diagnostic of left bundle branch block. And we know from the PREDICT CRT trial, which looked at 1,800 patients uh, who are eligible for CRT, the presence of a septal flash and apical rock was a very strong predictor for super response or normalization of LV function. Another technique that can be used to identify uh, left bundle branch block is speckle tracking strain on echo. A uh, speckle tracking strain is a computer algorithm that tracks speckle in the heart and graphs it over time. So uh, there's characteristic little uh, bubbles or, or lines in the LV myocardium. In this case, I've drawn a smiley face, but the, the computer can identify that and then it can track the speckle over time. So in this case, it sees the smile, smiley face and it can track it as it moves. So, so normal longitudinal strain, all the walls move together. When you have strict left bundle branch block, uh, the strain can be seen so that the septum contracts first and the lateral wall stretches. And then as the lateral wall activates, the, the septum stretches. <coughs> uh, that was a cartoon diagram, but in an, an actual heart, it looks like this. Whereas LVH mimicker of left bundle, you can see all the walls move together. Similarly, uh, when you have strict left bundle branch block and you undergo CRT, what you see is the left bundle here in this classical pattern. And then post CRT, you see all the wall walls uh, now moving together. And indeed, this is a patient who then was a super responder the EF normalized over time. So I'm now gonna go over cases. Uh, this was a 37 year old with a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and an EF of 20% and a wide left bundle branch block who's referred to me for CRT. You can see that this is clearly a left bundle. The QRS is well over 140 milliseconds. There is notching present. This meets stress criteria. Similarly, there is a septal flash and there is an apical rock. And this is a, a very sick heart. You can see it's dilated. There's just about no annular motion and the EF is, is very, very low. This patient, uh, due to the severity of its cardiomyopathy, received a uh, biventricular ICD. Here's an IC lead in the RV. Here's the coronary sinus lead. You can see on the lateral x-ray, there's excellent separation. CS lead is in the lateral wall. And this uses an algorithm called adaptive CRT, but the device uh, times CS pacing with the patient's intrinsic right bundle. You get a very nice narrow QRS. In one year post, you get excellent uh, reverse remodeling. Here you can see the EF is just about normal now, but most strikingly, the cardiac annulus moves really well. Uh, there's two ways that the heart pumps blood. One is with contraction, but the other is uh, annular motion. The heart is an isovolumetric pump. Another way of thinking of this is the diastolic function. The Mayo Clinic uses a lot of uh, uh, kind of complex formulas to calculate diastology, but I'm a disciple of Joe Kislow um, at the Duke Echo Lab. And what Joe always advocated was diastolic very simple. If the annulus is pumping, it has good diastolic function. Here's another uh, example. This is a patient who had a ischemic cardiomyopathy in the EF 20% who already had an ICD who was referred for upgrade to CRT. You can see this was the QRS morphology that led the referring cardiologist to send them to, to see us. Um, it meets criteria for classic left bundle, but you can see there's no notching. Top of that, when you look at this patient's echo, you can see the apex closes, the walls are, are uh, synchronous. There's no septal flash, there's no apical rock. This is not a left bundle branch block. Since this patient had a lead already in the right ventricle, you can further test this hypothesis by giving a surrogate left bundle and pacing. And what you see in this situation 
is when you pace, you get a markedly wide QRS with notches. And so um, this is what this patient would have if their conduction system was not intact, which is a, a really, really gross QRS. So we did not upgrade that patient. Um, one thing that's come up is if left bundle, left, left bundle branch block is harmful and RV pacing is down here, is, is that also harmful? Current guidelines for CRT are those within the EF of 35% or less, or, or for 2A indication, the block HF population of 50% or less. But those with normal EF uh, are only candidates for RV pacing. Is that harmful? Um, the answer is yes. For a certain set of patients, um, they will drop their EF over time if they get RV paced. And so there's a newer technique that was published in 2019 in Heart Rhythm called left bundle branch area pacing or left bundle pacing. Uh, this is a technique where we use a special lead for Medtronic to drill into the, um, the interventricular septum and try to capture the left bundle branch. By doing this, we can get uh, access to this kind of super highway and get the walls all to come in together and beat synchronously. This replaces an older technique called his bundle pacing, which has been around for years, but never quite caught on, in part because the his bundle is a tiny uh, structure. This picture doesn't do it justice. The left bundle is about eight times the size because it's a big band network. The his bundle is also uh, heavily insulated. So if you get a lead on it, the amount of energy it takes to capture can be quite high. It can also raise over time. The other problem with his bundle pacing is uh, when you put the lead, it's in the right atrium. So if you ultimately lose his bundle capture, or if there's block becomes more distal, um, it can be a problem if the patient needs pacing because they, they could potentially drop dead. Left bundle branch area pacing is so much better because the left bundle is a much bigger target. It's not insulated. The amount of energy to capture it is strikingly uh, low. And then if you do lose capture, you've got a lead in the septum itself, so you'll still capture the ventricle. Uh, on top of that, it's, it's just an easier procedure. Um, this is an example of a patient of mine who got an AV node ablation left bundle area pacer. This is a, a, a kind of a, uh, I guess, a, a textbook example where you get a pseudo right bundle branch block. V1 is a lead that looks over the right ventricle. So when uh, it's initially pacing, and this is quite narrow, this is the LV activating quickly, and then there's a late of activation of the right ventricle. And so it's a pseudo um, right bundle branch block. This is another example. You can see it's also pseudo right bundle. You can see there's kind of heterogeneity in these. This also was, was quite nice. Um, for patients who have intrinsic left bundle branch block on its own, you can still actually capture the remnants of the left bundle. The block tends to be up near the his bundle high. And so you can go to the remnants and you can still recruit it and you can still get these nice results. This is an example of a 56-year-old with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, left bundle branch block, and syncope. Uh, due to the syncope and the cardiomyopathy, it was thought he might have also had a ventricular uh, tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation event. This patient was referred, therefore, for biventricular ICD. If you look at his ECG, he's got a very wide left bundle with notching and one in ABL. You look at his echo, it's, it's strikingly sick. There is a septal flash and apical rock. Also remodeled so much that it's now spherical. If you look at the annulus, it's, it's uh, hardly moving. At least the right ventricle is moving, the left ventricle is not. And then when we did the CRT, we put the ICD lead and did this uh, venogram, which was uh, shows just kind of a very thin anterolateral vessel, another anterolateral vessel here. Fortunately, there's a big uh, posterior lateral vessel here, and this is the MCV, which doesn't go lateral, so it's not a target. We saw this and we went for the posterior lateral first. We wired this, we got a lead here. It seemed like it would be an easy case. Unfortunately, there was no capture of the left ventricle here. Sometimes we see that. We then wired the anterior lateral, again, put a lead out here, no capture. In fact, all it captured was the phrenic nerve, which goes here, and that causes kind of a hiccup sensation. We last tried that more true lateral uh, vessel, but we couldn't get the lead out there. So um, before left bundle branch area pacing, this patient would have been out of luck. We would have implanted an ICD lead, an atrial lead, and then maybe sent this patient to a surgeon to place an epicardial lead. Fortunately, uh, you know, we're now familiar with left bundle branch area pacing, and so we put a lead directly on the left bundle. This was, again, the baseline ECG, and then this was the result we got, which is you know, strikingly narrow. This LV activation time, where the time he gets to the left ventricle here is quite narrow. This is great. Immediately post echo, um, 
you can see the apical rock is gone. Yep, it's still down, and still not much inner motion. But in a year's time, um, you can see the function is, is, is significantly improved. It's probably about 45%. There's now a lot of annular motion, but we also no longer have that spherical shape of the, of the heart. Significant improvement. So it's not normal. Um, this patient is no longer on a diuretic, only has mild dyspnea on exertion and is uh, doing well. This patient is not able to take Entresto, and that's probably one of the reasons. Um, if he's able to take uh, medicines more, more regularly, his uh, heart function probably improve faster. That said, the funnel branch area pacing is not perfect. There's heterogeneity in ECG findings post the lead placement. This is because the RV septum can be captured, which can change the morphology. And echo can be helpful in sorting out incongruities. So one of the reasons why there's going to be a lot of different QRS morphologies is one, this little funnel branch is a, a big target. You can get maybe the anterior fascicle, the, the posterior fascicle down here. You might just get the tip and capture the left funnel itself. Um, there's also a ring here on this lead. Maybe the ring is capturing the right ventricle septum, and that has slower activation. It's a fusion of the two. So there, there's a lot of different uh, morphologies you can get. Echo can really help inform. And uh, what I want to show here is an example of a patient who was referred for pacemaker who had uh, an interesting finding. He had a narrow QRS, and then he had a left bundle, narrow, left bundle, narrow, left bundle, narrow, left bundle, kind of in a bigeminal pattern. And the reason why this is nice is because it informs um, what we want our left bundle pacers to look like. So you can see uh, uh, when the QRS is narrow, apex closes like a hinge, left bundle at rocks. Narrow, left bundle, narrow, left bundle. And so when we do left bundle pacing, what we want is uh, we want that echo to look like it's a narrow QRS. We don't want that apical rock. Uh, this is that same patient's left bundle pacer. Um, well, here's an example of an unclear ECG. This patient, everything looks pretty narrow, but there's actually a notch in two. We don't know what that that's about. It's a notch in V2 as well, and then uh, V1 is, is not perfect. So there's probably some some fusion between capture of the RV and, and the left bundle itself, but it wasn't certain. That said, when you look at the echo, there's no doubt this is synchronous. Everything looks good. Um, I'm going to go over an example of a nice ECG echo series for a patient um, where everything was really illustrative. This was a 63-year-old with an EF of 50%, diffuse conduction disease, Mobitz 2 on stress ECG, who's referred for pacemaker. Here's his baseline ECG. He has what you call a trifascicular block with a long PR, right bundle, and a left anterior fascicular block. Add more to the mix. He's got uh, some sinus node dysfunction. He's got some PVCs. Anyway, he got one of my first left bundle pacers, and uh, I was pretty happy with this result, but I wasn't certain because there's kind of this little pseudo-notch in V5, V6, and uh, I got an echo immediately post. You can see that it looks synchronous. The apex is closing like a hinge. The two walls are coming together. I thought, oh, great. This is a good outcome. Unfortunately, about a month later, uh, he developed a wide QRS complex uh, that, with a really big notch. Whatever portion of the conduction system I was capturing uh, is now gone. And here's what his echo looks like. You now have a pretty prominent apical rock. Yep, looks like it's down too. So we brought this guy back for revision. We put a uh, left funnel lead a little bit more distal. Then I put a CS backup lead in case I lost left funnel capture again. And I actually paced from all three. And what I got was this really nice uh, QRS morphology. And I call this a super by V. Um, about a year after we did this, uh, the Europeans published a patient paper called LOT CRT or left uh, bundle optimized resynchronization therapy. So you'll see a lot of people call this LOT CRT, but um, we like this term, so it's kind of stuck in our lab. And here's what this guy's super value looks like. You now see synchronous contraction, the EF the, uh, ejection fraction is, is normalized. Um, interestingly, as I was pulling this guy's ECGs and echoes for this presentation, I saw about a year later, he had a STEMI. And um, you may not always think you can see the SD changes in someone who's got a pacemaker, but if you've got a super 5 e you can. The uh, outcomes for left bundle branch area pacing uh, is still are still being reported, are still growing, but this is from a large European registry. And basically what it shows was that 
Um, you can get this uh, about 92% of the time um, when it's just for, for a narrow QRS, but people who have heart failure, it's a little bit harder probably because they have a baseline wider QRS. And the complication rate is uh, similar to um, similar to uh, regular pacing. Um, 3.7% 3, 3 of the time, you might actually go into the LV. That happens when you pull it out. Uh, what's pretty remarkable is there's, there's no no reports of strokes. Um, there's a very low rate of potential heart attack because you, you might hit a septal perforator. But on the whole, and this is very similar to uh, a standard RV lead. And then clinical outcomes in the, reported from the U.S., from two of the biggest implanters, have shown that when you compare uh, retrospectively RV pacing leads versus uh, left bundle leads, uh, there's a significantly lower rate of heart failure hospitalization or death when compared to RV pacing. So this is also strongly suggestive that this is a superior technique. In terms of resynchronization, we don't have a large randomized trial. However, this was recently published in Jack EP. This was 40 patients uh, who have a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and left bundle branch block. They're randomized either to left bundle uh, pacing versus uh, traditional CRT. And initially, this suggests that there's more benefit for left bundle uh, pace CRT. I would consider this hypothesis generating, uh, but uh, there are other trials in the works. Uh, there's a very large trial sponsored by the Timmy Group. Um, we've actually been in, uh, asked to join it. Um, we're actually we're probably the, the largest left bundle pacing center in New England, maybe also Vermont. Um, we do about 500 to 600 a year now. And we're pretty excited to potentially join that trial. Um, one issue for us is it uses Biotronic, which is a company we, that we have a, we, that doesn't always serve the, the patients of Maine. So we may not join for that reason, but we're otherwise be pretty enthusiastic participants. So in summary, CRT fixes dyssynchrony related cardiomyopathy. That dyssynchrony could be due to RV pacing or left bundle branch block. There are techniques to determine true left funnel branch block. We've got the Strauss criteria. We can use echo. We can use strain. And then left funnel branch area pacing is an exciting new form of pacing. The landmark randomized trials have yet to be performed. Thanks. If you have any questions, please email me. Okay, guys. <clears throat> this is a recording. So um, there's we. if you have any questions, we can email. Um, at Z, but that is the end of the presentation.